Good morning to everybody. Uh, hopefully you all manage uh, to join uh, on time. Welcome to the RAS uh, EIS workshop that is organized for the first time by the European Agricultural Society. So the aim of the event is to bring together key uh, figures uh, from the science and the industry uh, to present the latest knowledge uh, on the recirculation agricultural system, uh, discuss uh, challenges, but also share experience on RAS for different species. So as you know, uh, recirculation technologies have been improving a lot um, over recent times and they offer fantastic opportunities for farming uh, a broad range of uh, aquatic species from all over the world. But also we can farm them in a controlled manner and to supply year-round uh, production. So there are many uh, key benefits uh, from the systems, which include, uh, of course, reduced water usage uh, or improve uh, management of waste and uh, discharge and biosecurity. However, many gaps uh, in knowledge remain uh, to optimize the use of uh, these uh, systems. So the RASA EIS takes a different approach than the usual uh, scientific sessions that we uh, usually run at the uh, EIS annual event. Each RAS EIS um, uh, event is organized around panel discussion on specific challenges on recirculation with several uh, sub-sessions based on the interactive discussion uh, and audience uh, participation. So the panels are composed of experts from both industry and academia, and we're planning to uh, make the RAS EIS a regular event uh, organized by EIS, with the, the next one um, planned for Rimini in 2022. Okay, so today is the first RAS EIS workshop, and it's entitled Creating an Optimum Environment, and includes three sessions. Uh, the first one will uh, focus on disinfection strategies using RAS. The session will be moderated by uh, Jap Van Rien from the Institute of Marine Science in Elat. An introduction will be given by Chris Good from the Conservation Farm Freshwater Institute in the USA. Then we move on to uh, the second session on RAS monitoring and autonomy. And this session will be moderated by uh, Oivin Filling Jensen from Nofima with an introduction from Bard Sketchstart from Scale AQ. And finally, the third session, we will uh, discuss interactions between fish and RAS environment. And the session will be moderated by uh, Daniel Turner from BIM in Ireland, and with an introduction given by Jenina uh, Korarevich from the FEMA. Hello. You're very welcome back to uh, RAS at EAS. This is session three. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this morning's discussions. Uh, my name is Damien Toner. I work with BIM in Ireland and we were very much looking forward to welcoming you all to Cork for Aquaculture Europe. However, that's not to be. So it's still nonetheless great to hook up actually. And we've had some really interesting discussions this morning as part of this workshop and we hope in this session that we might touch upon some of the topics that have been raised and maybe delve a bit deeper into them as well. Um, so this session is, is looking at the most challenging interactions between fish and the RAS environment. And I guess when we think about that, there's kind of four main actors. We have the system itself and the fish, of course, but also the water. And what's quite often forgotten as well is the people, the people, the staff that manage these systems. So. We're going to, uh, in conjunction with the panelists, look at some of the issues that we feel um, are probably less understood in terms of interactions between fish and the environment. I'm going to introduce the panelists shortly after a presentation from uh, Yelena Kolarevich. So Yelena is a senior research scientist at Nofema. She, uh, many of you may be familiar with her work with the Control Aqua project. Her background is in fish physiology and fish biology, but in recent years, certainly since 2008, she's focused a lot of her work on RAS systems and semi-closed containment systems at sea as well. Um, and I suppose the focus of her work there is looking at fish welfare and performance and the interaction with the environment and the systems in which they are grown. Uh, as if this isn't enough, Elena has also recently uh, taken on the position as Professor of RAS Biology at the University of Tromso, 
and I know that's a position that's very much done in conjunction with industry. So she she has her ear to the ground very much in terms of what's happening with RAS systems within Norway and specifically with Atlantic Salmon. So after Yelena's presentation, we'll introduce you to the panelists who are going to help us uh, dissect some of the topics she's going to raise. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, for the introduction and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you have enjoyed the uh, discussions and uh, this workshop so far. My name is Jelena Kolarevic and I am a professor in RAS biology at the University in Tromsø and I'm also a senior researcher at Mathema uh, in both in Norway. So today I will give you a little introduction into some of the most challenging interactions between fish and RAS environment in order to kickstart our panel discussion that is to follow. And I will be using Atlantic salmon as a model species in my talk. The RAS is a relatively novel environment for aquaculture species compared to more traditional production methods. And the benefits and potential for increased and sustainable aquaculture production is well known to all of you. So I will not go into details on those aspects. Instead, I would like to point out some challenges that this novel environment poses on fish biology. Uh, all the water treatment processes provide required RAS uh, water quality. Exposure to sublethal uh, concentrations of toxic compounds like ammonia, nitrate and uh, CO2 are still uh, possible in RAS. Uh, further on, uh, fish are sharing its environment with uh, cultivated microbiota, as well as the opportunistic pathogens or organisms producing uh, potentially lethal compounds. Almost all modern RAS facilities are roofed and therefore fish are ex solely exposed to artificial lighting during their life in, in RAS. RAS environment has also allowed us to intensify the production using higher densities and uh, temperatures and production protocols that we now use uh, in RAS uh, for different life stages that we haven't used before. Um, in the end, uh, we are just starting to learn more about the prolonged, uh, the effects of prolonged production in RAS and how this is affecting further production in sea cages for salmon that is not solely produced uh, on land uh, to slaughter size. So what is RAS environment? It is everything that surrounds uh, fish and affects them during uh, their production RAS system. And here on the screen uh, in these big bubbles, you can see main components of RAS environment, starting with the microbiota consisting of nitrifying bacteria such as ammonia oxidizing and nitrate oxidizing bacteria. Uh, heterotrophic bacteria, sulfur reducing bacteria, just to name some, uh, some of the bacteria present, but also gut and skin microbiota that are residing on or in the fish. Feed uh, is the main component that is added to RAS together with fish and with its characteristics like its composition, digestibility and stability, uh, feed affects all components in, in RAS. Further on, we add a number of chemicals uh, to our water to buffer it or to disinfect it. Uh, tank environment uh, with its velocity, hydrodynamics, lighting and the design, uh, the production protocols uh, that affect the stability of the system, and of course, water quality with many of its characteristics uh, that are regularly monitored in a daily operation. So the complexity of this RAS environment is further increased by the fact that all components of RAS environment interact with each other, are affecting and are affected by one or more of the components. So we could spend the, the whole day uh, today talking about each and every component of RAS environment. And I hope that we 
we there will be more opportunities to do this during future RAS DIS workshops uh, uh, for more discussions. But for today, um, I have chosen a couple of aspects of RAS environment that are still debated and that we can discuss further uh, today. One of the interesting ongoing uh, discussion is related to the RAS water appearance. Some farmers like to see their fish, while others are prone to think that turbid RAS water can be less stressful for the fish. And the turbidity is among uh, uh, other things associated to the accumulation of fine solids uh, in the production water. The measurement of the suspended particles is often uh, expressed as total suspended solids or TSS as we know it, given as dry mass concentration uh, per volume in milligrams per liter. And a recent uh, very good review by Mark Schumann and Alexander Brinker, who is also part of our panel later on, has shown that suspended solids in salmonid brass are generally maintained uh, between 20 and 25 milligrams per liter. And uh, suspended uh, solids, as you can see uh, in this slide here, um, they uh, in aquaculture, they can come from different origins. They can have a mineral origin, uh, biotic origin, but the majority of all the solids uh, in aquaculture or in raw system originate from uneaten feed and pieces, and to some extent, uh, biofilm debris. However, to really understand the effect the suspended solids might have on fish microbiota and system operation, we really need to look into their physical, mechanical and uh, chemical characteristics and not just the total mess. So, for example, we know that solid uh, removal strategies are depending on the particle size distribution in, in, in the system or that the shape of the particles play a role when direct damages to fish are in question. Uh, suspended solids in rats are mainly affected by feed and the reared uh, species, or more precisely, their feces. Here uh, in this graph, uh, we can see how, let's say, changes in the composition of feed can affect the particle size distribution, as shown by Schumann and Brinker. Makeup water can also be the source of particles, especially uh, in systems where the exchange rates are high, or often during seasonal uh, events like flooding or snow melting. So production intensity and increased fecal production can also attribute to uh, solid uh, creation, as well as the water treatment, fragmentation from pump use or the type of solid removals in the system. In return, solids are affecting all aspects of our environment. When it comes to fish health and welfare, and this nice image from the same review summarizes uh, the direct and indirect impact of suspended solids from different origins. Um, it is very important to say that almost all available data on direct effect uh, come from studies done in natural systems with exposure to mineral sharp uh, particles where increased cortisol levels and mortalities were reported. However, there is almost no documentation on negative effects of solids from aquaculture systems. A couple of studies um, have, uh, that have been recently done uh, on trout uh, that was exposed up to 70 milligram per liter TSS without any adverse, uh, showed that there were no uh, adverse effects on health and welfare. Current uh, standing recommendation for salmonids is around 20 to 25 milligram per liter, but this recommendation has not been uh, properly uh, documented. Uh, solids uh, can, apart from direct effect on fish, have an either indirect effect on their behavior via its effect on water clarity and uh, with its uh, feeding and aggression uh, among the fish. Um, increased particle surface availability can lead to increased microbial growth, reduced biofilter and disinfection efficiency. Water quality and system stability are also affected. 
And last but not the least, uh, suspended solids have a strong effect on light quality and quantity in rust. And a recent study done by the FEMA and led by my colleague Andrew Neriak showed that the TSS of close to 20 mg per liter, only 10% of the surface light penetrates up to one uh, meter of water column, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, yellow square. And only 0.1% uh, uh, comes down to three meters, which is more common uh, depth. Uh, in uh, tanks in commercial uh, sites. Also, we observed that the light quality is affected and that uh, there is a higher absorbance in the blue compared to the red part uh, of the spectra. So, uh, with all this in mind, uh, can we say that 20 to 25 milligram per liter TSS in RAS is optimal for salmon? Or is it enough to just state um, the total mass of the suspended solids and not say something about uh, the, the characteristics of the suspended solids? And we, if we say that we need to reduce uh, the amount of solids uh, in rust, uh, how can we design more efficient ways of solid removals when, for example, there is an ongoing change in feed formulation that is often also dependent on the availability of different ingredients on the market. And for example, we can discuss, can we further improve heating management in RAS and in that way um, affect the presence of the suspended solids in the system? So these are just some of the questions that we can come back to uh, during our panel discussion. Moving on to another water quality parameter, namely the salinity. Uh, the change from small to post-small phase can be followed by increase in salinity, which poses an effect on whole rice environment. And today, salmon is produced in both freshwater and seawater, and we are seeing some tendencies that producers are uh, reducing use of seawater in uh, post-small phase on land. So what do we know about the effect of salinity on fish biofilter and system performance? So my colleague uh, Tina Interstoil and, and uh, collaborators have shown that salmon postmod read in 12 ppt and at one body length per second uh, velocity have better survival growth FCR compared to postmod grown at uh, 22 or 32 ppt. Uh, also, Sharada Navada has uh, done her PhD um, where she has actually looked uh, into uh, the effects that salinity has on the nitrification uh, process in the bioreactor. And uh, she has, uh, among other things, documented uh, uh, how maximum ammonia and nitrate oxidation rates of biofilters are reduced with increase in uh, salinity. And that you can see in these two graphs. So if you look at this uh, light green um, uh, line and you can see uh, how bio, uh, this uh, nitrification rates are affected when uh, uh, biofilm is moved from freshwater into the seawater and how these uh, oxidation rates are reduced. But also she's shown that there are ways to overcome these issues. For example, if you previously prime your biofilter to higher salinities, as Sharada has done, and you can see in the blue line, uh, if you do that, uh, at the moment that you change the salinity from fresh water into the seawater, uh, you don't see this drop in the nitrification rate. Further on, we know that the water treatment efficiency is also affected by salinity. We know that for CO2 and we also know that for tan removal efficiency as shown in this uh, graph. This is uh, taken from the same study uh, that uh, Trina has uh, done and you can see here on day 84 and 207 clearly how the uh, increase in salinity uh, negatively affects the tan removal rates. Uh, last but not uh, least, if one is using seawater in brass, there is an increased risk of uh, hydrogen sulfide due to the highest uh, sulfate content in the water source. Uh, 
we see that the level of concern um, and mass mortalities are reduced, at least in Norway in, in the last year, as farmers are taking better precaution to clean and maintain their uh, systems. So uh, to put it out there, uh, should we continue to use uh, salinity or better said seawater to produce uh, post -mults? Uh, do we need the salt water to do that? Um, can we further improve the nitrification rates when increasing the salinity in grass? Or is it reasonable that we are changing the salinity while fish are still in the system when we know the effects that increased salinity can have on the biofilter efficiency? Also, how can we reduce risk? when using seawater in rust so that we don't see the mass mortalities. These are again some of the questions that we can take up again in, during our panel discussion. On to my last topic uh, for today and that uh, I call the RAS baggage after speaking to my uh, panelists, uh, to the colleagues in the panel and Basically, what I mean with this is that do we know what fish take with them from RAS into the sea cages? And uh, do any potential issues and benefits follow fish further into the sea? I will just give you two examples and answers that we have documented uh, so far. So another colleague of mine, Vasco Mota and collaborators have exposed salmon to CO2, POSMO to CO2 uh, from 5 to 40 milligram per liter in grass for 12 weeks. And here you can see the two graphs where you can see the growth and the fish size uh, dependent on the CO2 concentrations and throughout the experiment. So what uh, Vasco has seen is that you can see a very clear um, correlation between increase in CO2 concentration and reduction in growth. And uh, we have seen this uh, particularly in the last part of the, of the RAS phase. But when we have moved the fish further on into the seawater with a very low CO2 concentration straight after the RAS, uh, uh, the RAS phase for six weeks, we have observed uh, uh, the carry-on effect uh, of CO2 exposure further on into this stage, uh, where again the fish that uh, uh, were exposed to the lowest CO2 concentration have even increased uh, their uh, difference in size compared to the fish that were exposed to high uh, CO2 concentrations. So very clearly the effect uh, from RAS uh, was carried on further into the seawater phase. In another experiment where we have used different protocols to smaltify uh, salmon, we have seen that in RAS phase, here you can see in the light blue line, uh, the smalt that we produced uh, are 24 hour light and 12 PPT had the absolute best uh, growth in the RAS phase compared to fish that were produced uh, on uh, 12 hours of light and darkness and also in fresh water. But we see clearly here and uh, marked in, with this red arrow that straight after the transfer in the first uh, phase in the sea when fish are the most sensitive actually, uh, that uh, this group that had the best growth in RAS uh, uh, had the worst growth in, in during this phase. And these fish, fish have uh, spent the rest of their production time basically catching up to, to these other groups. Um, so, knowing all this, my question is how can we best prepare salmon for life in sea? Do we know enough on the effects of RAS environment and how this will uh, further on affect the fish uh, in the sea? So, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts through your questions and uh, I'm looking forward to, to our discussion in the continuation of uh, this uh, session. So, so for now, thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention. Thank you, Elena.
Thanks very much, Elena, for a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation. If we can answer all the questions you have posed, we will we will have achieved an awful lot this afternoon. Uh, so to help us answer those questions, we have some panelists who I'm going to introduce. We have John Walden, uh, Frederick Gamay and Rod Wilson. Unfortunately, Alexander Brinker hasn't been able to join us due to technical difficulties. Um, but I might ask um, the guys to just briefly introduce themselves. Maybe start with you, Frederick, if you wouldn't mind, please. Yes, thanks for the for the invitation. Very interesting uh, topic uh, along the two other topics we have this morning. So my name is uh, Frederic Gomez. I am uh, head of uh, research and development for Kroekalnes in Norway. So Kroekalnes is a subsidiary of uh, Veolia, which is one of the world's largest uh, company in uh, water and waste treatments. And in uh, Kroekalnes, we are dedicated to uh, aquaculture, solution for aquaculture, um, especially RAS. Uh, where we deliver design solution and also some some service for the uh, for the um, farming industry. So as a background, I have a PhD in uh, fish physiology from uh, Ifremer in France, and for the last uh, 30 plus uh, years, uh, I've been working in uh, operating and also uh, managing uh, European funded projects. Uh, related to RAS uh, technology uh, in, in production in many places in the world from Iceland to uh, the south of the Indian Ocean. Mostly dealing with uh, marine fish, I will say, uh, a lot on Mediterranean fish and also some on the subtropical and tropical fish. Great, great to have you, Frederick. Rod, if you might introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Damien. Um, Great to be here. So I'm Rod Wilson. I'm a physiologist at Exeter University in the southwest of England. And here we are one of half of the Sustainable Aquaculture Futures Centre in collaboration with CFAS in the UK. So I work on fish and invertebrates to understand in particular how the physical chemical environment they live in affects their physiology, their behaviour, health and performance generally, such as growth, relevant things like exercise capacity. Variables I study include those linked to extremes found in nature, but also climate change and those peculiar to intensive RAS. So carbon dioxide is, is an obvious one, but how we try to manage CO2 clearly affects other things like alkalinity and pH. So they're relevant as well. But I also study how salinity, nitrogenous wastes, calcium hardness, things like that affect gill and general health and physiology and overall performance. I have collaborations with feed companies that are focused on how both nutritional and non-nutritional diet manipulations can reduce energetic costs for the animal and thereby improve efficiency of growth or improve their tolerance of environmental variables. So that's relevant to RAS too. Now, um, not so relevant to aquaculture perhaps, but I have a lot of experience studying the impacts of anthropogenic pollutants, including toxic metals, but also organic chemicals such as pesticides and pharmaceuticals. So I think that's enough from me. Great, Rod. Great to have you with us. And finally, but no means least, John, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Damien. Uh, I'm John Walden. I am the uh, freshwater production manager for Greek Seafood in Shetland. I've been uh, working in or studying aquaculture for over 25 years. And in that time, I've covered uh, a wide range of species and systems, everything from pond culture of rainbow trout, through to uh, marine species, the, the larva culture stages, marine species like Atlantic cod. But for the last 12 years, I've been working with Atlantic salmon. And for the last ooh, nine years, I've been involved in the construction and management of our research uh, salmon hatchery in Shetland. During that time, I think I've seen the good, the bad and the frequently unexplained of a RAS. And I think this is uh, this is why I'm very, very uh, delighted to be involved today because there's quite clearly a lot of these interactions that we don't understand well. We think we well, we maybe think we do, um, or we just don't know about them. But I see these I call biological curveballs turning up relatively often. Um, and it's quite clear we don't understand uh, what's going on. From a biologist's point of view, it's fascinating. From a production manager's point of view, less so. It's very frustrating and challenging. So I, you know, I'm uh, I, I'm on the sharp end of this and uh, I'll be looking for anything I can get from this today. 
Great. Thanks, John. Um, so I, I'll just explain maybe a bit for the attendees. You have a question and an answer function that you can use on, on, the, on the chat. So please, if you would like to get the panelists view on some topics or questions, please fire them in. Um, to have a bit of structure around this discussion, Elena has raised kind of three broad topics. So suspended solids, salinity and what we call RAS baggage. So we're going to spend the first part of this discussion this afternoon looking at suspended solids for maybe about 50, 60 minutes, and then we might take a short break and then come back and discuss salinity and RAS baggage. So if you could confine your questions maybe to those three broad topics whilst we're discussing them, it would make it a bit easier probably. So I, I think just to kick things off, Yelena, in terms of suspended solids, you, you pose a question there at the, at, at the start of your presentation about the optimum levels for suspended solids. I'm just interested from a kind of, from Nofema's point of view or from a research scientist's point of view, what you believe maybe, there's no correct answer there, but what are the kind of, I suppose, variables affecting that and, and how, how it affects the system and the, the fish interaction with the system as well. Yeah, so um, basically we see recently, I mentioned a couple of studies that were done on, on the trout in, in the relevant environment. And that's maybe most important to say that we are still learning about the characteristics of the particles in, in aquaculture and particularly in rice environment. And, it's basically now in 2020, the first paper that came out showing a little bit what is the shape of a particle, the most common shape of a particle in uh, aquaculture environment, which is uh, quite different to what we see uh, and observe in, in the natural environment. So I think uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to talk about TSS and we are finding out more and more. Of course, it's, it's easier to have one way to measure and represent suspended solids. But often enough, uh, working with RAS, we are finding that uh, we need to know more uh, about it uh, due to all the effects they have. I mentioned just some of the effects, uh, for example, you know, pr providing a surface area for bacterial growth. Uh, that will very much depend on the, the shape of the particle. And so far in all the research work and, and even when the when people design um, systems and Frederick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we assume that all uh, particles are spherical uh, and just that can give a big source of error, so to say, both for the design of the system, but also when we think about the effect on, on, on fish. So I think I'll stop there to give others uh, opportunity to say yeah, something. I, I, I might ask Frederick to come in, but maybe first, John, if you just outline from an industry point of view, you know, dealing with microparticles, nanoparticles in systems, you know, it's it's you know, it's a common problem, I would imagine, for you on a day to day basis. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And of course, um, I think this is more widely recognized now. Obviously, the systems are very different. You're going to face a, a totally different set of circumstances in a system with a fixed bed as opposed to a moving bed. Uh, we have a moving bed uh, and when it was designed and built, I guess there wasn't a great deal of attention paid to this. It's very difficult now to retrofit the solution to take those particles out. Um, so it's not just a case of is the uh, is there a solution out there? It's, can we get it in as well is uh, is also very relevant, but it's um, it's very interesting what Elena um, put up about the frequently found levels of suspended solids in the systems and actually um, whether these are actually bad for the fish or not. Uh, our water is very turbid. Um, I couldn't tell you what the suspended solid level is, um, but the fish seem to grow very well. Um, they grow as expected. Their survival is good. We don't see damage to the gills. We don't see physical damage to the fish. Um, what's the issue here? Well, it's not quite as simple as that because obviously as stockmen, you, you do need to be able to see your fish. If you're, for example, at, um, determining your feed rates by watching the reaction of the fish to feed, if you can't see them, that then becomes very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's just very difficult. And then you are relying on the skill of your staff. Um, so it's and it's not something you just pick up just like that. 
so the, there's there's that side of it. Um, there's obviously the effect uh, on, on light penetration, but I think going back to something that was raised in the previous session, if we are uh, going to go down the um, the route of fish welfare being assessed by behaviour, uh, which I think is something that will there will be more pressure over time to do this. Again, if you can't see the fish, that's not going to work, and we're probably going to have to address this from that point of view, if nothing else. Frederick, I might bring you in there just to discuss that that topic about suspended solids and, and its generation within the system and removal. Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, it, it, it's clear. I mean, we a uh, lot of people talk about turbidity and RAS, and John was well illustrating that. And you 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 need to dig a little more in what is turbidity. So as uh, Yelena presented, I mean, you have a part of it which is a dissolve element and colloidal element, and then you have a lot of small small particle. I mean, re recent documentation uh, ha have shown that uh, and RAS water is quite active and bio biologically active water. That if you want to have a significant effect on on turbidity uh, removing particle, you, you need to filtrate down to one micrometer. Uh, that's most of the system don't do in in, in routine. Uh, what what is important and that that will be the, the the red line for all the discussion this afternoon is we need to offer a, a stable kind of a stasis state for, for, for the fish. Uh, and dealing with particle, the first thing to do is to remove the large organic soft particle. Uh, as soon as possible on, on the right way without breaking the particle. And typically it's achieved with mechanical filtration in the range at best 20 to 60, 90 micron, depending on that. Uh, if already you, you, you do it well and it's, uh, it's it's, it's based on design, you know, uh, hydrodynamic in the tank, uh, self-cleaning of the tank, uh, hydrodynamic in the in the piping, and uh, uh, how you uh, you install and you operate your mechanical filters in the range of uh, filtration I mentioned. Uh, it's already a good a good start. Uh, then to remove a smaller particle, uh, you need to add uh, other elements like oxidation or additional filtration. Uh, which are some pro and cons and definitely have some uh, some cost in, in capex and opex and the old question is uh, is it uh, needed or not it depends so much on the operators as john mentioned uh, you have some people living with uh, colored water if i don't want to use the the, the warding uh, turbid uh, and they're happy with that they have the best fish ever they grow well they perform well they also perform well in sea they don't see any reason to put more money in having a transplant water. Uh, and some other have uh, some more challenges. Uh, but but yeah, particle is uh, is quite a big topic. I think that, you know, John Richmond mentioned that in one of the earlier sessions about finding the sweet spot. And I think probably you agree with that, John, in terms of, you know, you're not going to get a perfect system or a perfect balance. And it's just about getting something that works, you know, and delivers you know, from a production point of view, what you needed to deliver and from a fish welfare point of view. Rod, just on that point about suspended solids and maybe the effect on the fish, I see a comment there about um, in the chat box about, uh, you know, the concentration of TSS as such is not the major issue. It's more the biological activity of the particles. Just interested in, in, in the effect of those suspended solid particles on the gills of the fish, the physiology of the fish within the system. OK, it's, it's a good question. It's one I can't answer. So my expertise does not cover uh, suspended particulate matter per se. Um, I do know a bit more about how that can result in higher levels of dissolved organic carbon, which can add the colour that Frederick was talking about. Uh, and something we've talked about before is that it's not just colour. Colour is not one thing. It, within that, there's different types of organic carbon that's dissolved. They can have different impacts on the physiology of the gills, for example. So there are lots of layers of nuance, I think, once we start to learn more about all these aspects. Um, sorry, I can't answer your question directly, Damien. I would like to perhaps make a general point, though. So Yelena made issues highlighted three areas, dissolved, uh, sorry, total suspended solid particles, salinity and CO2. And each of those is highly relevant to study in their own right. We know they have impacts. 
But I would like to make the point, and, and, and as we talked about this morning a bit, there'll be a sweet spot for each of those variables. And there'll be an upper threshold that you don't want to go past for each of those variables. But the point I want to make is that sweet spot and that upper threshold will not be the same when you vary all the other things. Salinity and CO2 are perhaps a really good example that I can tell you about. So the one thing we know salinity does is as you increase it, it changes the water balance of the animal. Now a truly freshwater fish is producing truly copious amounts of urine in its kidneys all the time. Its kidneys have been flushed through an uh, incredibly high rate. As the salinity goes up, the urine flow rate, the need for the kidney to produce urine just goes down and down and down. So at the other extreme, a seawater fish is producing almost no urine. It empties its bladder about three times, sorry, once every three days, something like that. And so anything that causes kidney problems like nephrocalcinosis is probably going to be worse as the salinity gets higher. Now, given that CO2 is associated with nephrocalcinosis, now stepping back a bit, it's clearly not the only cause. It's a multifactorial thing. But if CO2 is one of the causes of nephrocalcinosis, then you can't really study CO2 on its own without considering salinity, hardness, phosphate in the water, phosphate in the diet most likely. So my point is that we have to understand, understand interactive effects of all these things to really get to the point where we want to be, which is precision aquaculture. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. And it was something that was raised earlier as well in terms of a lot of farms record a lot of data, but how we use that data and how systems utilize it is is really lacking in terms of data mining. So, you know, it's quite normal on a fish farm to record a wide range of water parameters, but not really understand how they're actually affecting the system or the fish. You're just checking that it's within a certain range, you know. Um, so sorry, Elena, you wanted to come in there on that point. Uh, yeah, just I just wanted to say, I mean, like like I said, this this is so complex. Uh, it's very difficult to just pick out one parameter and talk to, talk about only that one. When I mean, we saw that earlier in the presentation, whichever component you, you choose, they, whatever you do with it. Uh, for better or worse, you will impact the rest of the system, the fish, uh, the microbiota. So, so basically, this this stability and this balance that we want to have in a RAS, in an operating RAS, when everything is stable, uh, that that's maybe the sweet spot we are talking about. Uh, that that's the stability we want. But uh, within the production, we know that we will reach the points when we have to break this stability. For example, you know, every time you're handling your fish, uh, uh, you're vaccinating, so, so you're breaking this stability. Uh, and we know that salmon is very good to adapt to, to which conditions you give and also the sublethal uh, uh, circumstances, you know, as long as you give them stability. Uh, but just the nature of the production in particular until the grow up phase, that, that's a little bit different uh, scenario. But uh, up to up to the grow up phase, you really are breaking the stability and we really need to learn how to handle those situations and, and to act quickly to get the balance right, so to say. Absolutely. J just to pick up on a point that, that John made there about a system operating with suspended solids and fish are doing fine. And one of the comments here in, in, in the chat box is that do you agree that that RAS water polished by ozonated protein skimming uh, that reduces TSS is not only beneficial for fish health and growth, but also for operational costs in terms of efficiency of oxygenation and feed conversion. So, you know, this idea, Frederick, that, you know, if you if you reduce your suspended solid load within a system, it 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 might not necessarily have an enormous effect on fish performance because they were they were fine, but it could affect other tangibles which will you know, affect the bottom line essentially. Uh, yes, that's that's clear. I mean, as as we discussed before, I mean the 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 front line uh, dealing with uh, particle in rust is the mechanical filtration. And as I say, for practical and economical reason, you you. You, you, you are you're stuck in a range of uh, opening for 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 the mesh or the filtration you use which are only removing uh, a small part of the particle uh, 
so and, and we have seen, I mean, that they, they had a lot of research using oxidation, like ozone uh, protein schema. Uh, it was mentioned er, uh, earlier today, uh, especially in seawater where protein skimming is more efficient. Uh, Ultra filtration, you know, we, we document also with uh, with Nofima years ago that the side stream with ultra filtration down to let's say 0 0.04 micrometer, you had a huge effect on the turbidity, you even enhanced the, the, the nitrification into the biofilter. Uh, but, but, but still, you uh, so this uh, polishing uh, approach, you can call it polishing the water in terms of particle and, and turbidity. Yes, they are good for, for the system and uh, not only on the fish itself, but the water quality, uh, the balance of the water quality, uh, also maybe the biological treatments. Um, uh, that's, uh, but what is important is that, and if you don't have this polishing system, you only rely on the dilution, you know, the makeup water you, you give in the system and then what you get out. That's the only way to deal and not building up in this small particle that will be, be crush anyway, turning 150% per hour per day uh, into your system. What is really more important in terms of managing a particle or let's say organic loading is that you keep a control on this organic loading. If you let it settle sediment somewhere into the system, build, build up somewhere in, into the system, you know, either by just sedimentation in the in, in dead zone or slow velocity zone into your system, pipes or pump sump, or uh, build up into building up biofilm fixed on, 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 uh, on surface into your system, then you, you lose the control on this, uh, on this organic loading. And then you lead to, uh, uh, bacterial activity and order that you, you, you don't want, you know, and releasing metabolites uh, or chemicals like H2S or flavor, you can mention it. So uh, that's the most important is to have a control on. You will have a mature system. You will have a lot of very extremely small particles that move around the system that you, you need to put some more efforts and equipment uh, and, and cost on that. Uh, it can be discussed from operator to operators and, and plant to, to plants, design to design. But probably the most important is you, you have a control on what is happening and you don't let the organic, uh, organic matter uh, accumulate in some place of the system where you don't have control. Elena? I just wanted to touch on uh, now that uh, Frederick was talking about it. I mean, turbidity directly affects, you know, we're talking about fish and system performance, but just to touch on and, and connect to the previous session, we're talking about how beha behavior is important and how we want to monitor behavior, but actually uh, the visibility, water visibility, was one thing that was limiting the technology that is currently available to access RAS systems and to actually allow us to, to monitor behavior. Uh, for example, different use of camera systems. I know that throughout the years now, the camera technology is getting better and better, but, uh, but we were quite limited into what we were able to see. And in particular, if you have uh, a highly turbid water and you have deep tanks where you actually don't have enough light. So in a way, uh, we, are, we have to look at everything uh, from like a, a balance uh, point and uh, and you know, like some things might uh, be positive for the fish indirectly, uh, not just if we don't see any effect on, on the gill health, for example. Uh, but of course, you know, just to use the camera systems in RAS should not be the main goal why one should keep their water clean. Absolutely. So there's a lot, a lot here to, to discuss, and then depending on the directions where we see we're going and. Yeah. The, there, there are a number of questions which uh, I'll get to. I just want to touch on a subject that was brought up there and was in the previous session around cleaning of systems and tanks. And, you know, it strikes me that suspended solids and systems are obviously generated by addition of feed, but also, as Frederick just touched on, by buildup of biome in the systems. And I'm just wondering, John, from a practical point of view in cleaning the systems and you know, it, it was mentioned earlier about the development of cleaning technology, that there isn't much automation in, in RAS systems yet in terms of cleaning. And that's something that the sector needs to really look at to try and maintain, you know, nice clean systems, particularly with pipework. Absolutely. Um, 
there's from a, a practical point of view an, an example i can give you is that um you may have say five five tanks on a line and the outlet pipe work for those five tanks is spec to handle five tanks and that gives you a, a water speed that's above settling velocity and nothing is going to settle out but of course you might not be running all of those the whole time and then you have to ask yourself at what point are we running so few tanks that we are going to get settling out and not be aware of it um, this is the danger it's out of sight you can't see it it might be there and then all of a sudden you might put them all back on and then you've got hydrogen sulfide building up so it, it's it's something that you maybe don't think of initially but with experience usually bad experience you you do tend to start to think about these things but you're quite right if we could have if there was more automation uh, and I love the, the the comment made earlier about the oil industry actually cleaning its pipes because it's important. Well, actually, it's pretty important for us as well. It's just we don't do it. We haven't got to that point um, where we where we I think where we've really realised how important this how important this is. But yes, uh, automation. Um, if we could have some automatic systems for cleaning pipes and uh, and water treatment units, that'd be fantastic. Yes, please. Yeah, Frederick, we all want something with a button that we can press and uh, does this work? So uh, any, it, any suggestions? Well, uh, well, th there are some uh, cleaning robots uh, coming from the industry. I mean, some company have been using cleaning robots in large reservoir, even nuclear power point plants, sorry, uh, that start to be uh, applied and tested in, uh, in aquaculture to clean the bottom of the extremely large tank we are dealing with, uh, in, including pipe. Uh, I, I have to comment to what Yelena said to keep on on the discussion and I'll see I see link to some of the, the question we have. Uh, I mean, we, we must, it's like everything into a RAS. I mean, a RAS is a concentrating box where you, we, you reuse the, the water several times per hour. Uh, and you concentrate until you treat it or dilute. You know what's coming need to come out under such form. Uh, we need also to 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 keep in mind that you have different source of uh, incoming uh, particles that will be transformed by the system or starting transformed by the fish. Of course, there is the feed. Uh, there is also the makeup water because. Basically, makeup water is mostly uh, treated uh, by disinfection, uh, different solution. It could be pre-treated by, by filtration just to secure that the disinfection is doing the job. But it's not common to do, at least in large uh, RAS, I'm not talking about marine hatcheries, it's not common to filter the makeup water less than maybe 900 micrometer. If you're good, maybe a little less, 50. You will not filtrate your makeup water at one micrometer. And in, in a lot of RAS, at least in Norway, the water is coming from surface water. It's not groundwater. And don't forget the chemicals. Uh, we have seen some uh, accumulation and circulation of particles coming from the type of chemicals that are used to, to adjust the pH. And one answer to what you were asking, Damien, and uh, Jan commenting is, uh, yes, how to mo modelize this particle? You know, with CFD, uh, computerized fluid dynamic, uh, I see one question on the self-cleaning of tank. Uh, it's extremely tricky already to do some good CFD modeling on tank with particle. I know in Control Aqua we are starting to work to work with, you know, to take two size, two type of particle, a big one and a small one, and try to modelize. And yes, we have to assume they are circular particle. If not the CFD, the, the model will not work. And the fish is not even into the picture for this modeling. But imagine how to do CFD modeling of the all different compartments in RAS, including the piping, the sump, uh, the biofilters of different kind and all other equipment. That's really, really tricky. So uh, uh, yes, design need to uh, try to make things uh, easy to clean, easy to access, uh, clean in operation, clean between operation. Uh, but you will not be able to uh, solve, answer everything by just design and type of equipment you have. Operation is uh, will be uh, the the key on uh, on the long run. There's a question here which I, I, I'm going to just pose in this section. It, it, it's not necessarily primarily to do with suspended solids, but it, it is related. So what are the panelists' views on using microbiome dosing with bacteria specialized for seawater to help manage the shift in the biofilter? Um, I'm not entirely sure what, what they mean by shift in biofilter, but Elena, have you any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so they, they are probably thinking about uh, to get the micro microbiota that are uh, adapted to seawater and function properly in seawater, uh, because that is the challenge. Once you change the salinity, then uh, the efficiency, uh, nitrification efficiency goes down. So yes, that's one of the ways of that you could kind of speed up the the process uh, in, in, in this uh, transfer between salinities. But um, I personally haven't worked with any of those uh, um, products. Maybe Frederick uh, knows more, but uh, there is a certain um, there is a certain level of um, um, security there in, in regard to biosecurity and the products that you're taking in. Um, and also what is very important, what we see so far is that very often whatever you take in of these uh, uh, pre-made or purchased products, uh, it is what your intake water contains that will end up probably being a part of your biofilm, uh, really. So, so it's it's a question of uh, how these products would survive, so to say, in one already mature uh, biofilter that was functioning on a certain uh, salinity. Frederick, did you want to come in there on that topic? Uh, yes, uh, I. And Irena, uh, what Liana says is really true. I mean, you, you had a lot of recent research to, to show that uh, each uh, biofilter, even each, each has water, each has environment, including the fish, uh, you know, between the, the, the biofilm, uh, between the, the water and the, the fish uh, microbiota, mostly in the gut, they have their own signature. Uh, so what you can help if you want to have your uh, biofilter to uh, acquire some functionality or resilience, uh, and salinity is a good example, you can either prime your system, challenge your system, you know, uh, with the first uh, chalk of salinity and let the system uh, cope with it and uh, adapt. Uh, it can be adapted by uh, adjustment or rec recolonization. And then you can also use uh, seeding or inoculation. So the difference is that inoculation, you will have external bacteria, could be commercial package that you buy. Uh, and seeding will be that you have on site uh, some uh, biomedia with your biofilm, uh, which is there, which is adapted, and you can use to seed uh, a new uh, a new biofilter, especially during startup, and, and acquire this uh, this functionality. But I, I agree that uh, it takes time. It's costly to use inoculum, and at the end, your biofilter will will be the the picture of your local environment, including the makeup water, including everything. Question here, which Rod and Mike, get your view on. Um, how does the panel feel about making species specific physiology, i.e. growth and behavioral studies compulsory before any new species are farmed in RAS? So I think this was kind of touched on earlier in the other session as well about the idea of, of getting to a certain stage within research and development before um, things are commercialized. Yeah. Uh Quite simply, I think it's a no-brainer that you would obviously need to find what optimal conditions are within an RAS setting for any new species that you want to uh, engage in producing. Um, species um, tolerance of all sorts of things varies hugely from, uh, the most extreme would be anoxia tolerant carp and a salmonid species, okay? Zero oxygen versus, you know, the, you can't grow salmon at very low oxygen. Um, but the same will apply to all sorts of parameters that are relevant to RAS. Um, so to me, it's a no brainer. You have to engage in that before you know what, what your fish are going to grow well in and keep healthy. Elena, you wanted to come in on that? Yes, I just want to second what Rod is saying. And I just want to say also from the standpoint of the industry, you want to know what you're going to pay for. I mean, uh, if, if you, like we said, uh, have a system that works for salmonids, that, that system just building and designing because you really want a very specific uh, uh, water quality it might be much more expensive than for, for carp, for example. And then there's a reason why we don't grow carp in RAS, right? So, so in a way, uh, if you want to build a facility, we have seen that with the cleaner fish uh, at one point in Norway when people started to be interested in 
growing this, uh, let's say, bowel unrest that is preferring higher higher temperatures and that can benefit from from having warmer water from rust in a way uh, that people just try to experiment with the already existing solutions for salmon and then they say oh this doesn't work uh, move on so so it's it's very dangerous to, to just think that whatever we produce for one species would fit for everything else we would like to work with in the future so it's, it's a big danger there and uh, and you need, really need to know what are the requirements for the water quality before you set on on designing and, and making systems uh, for any other species. I guess, I guess one of the problems there is replicating commercial systems in, you know, research settings. You know that in order for researchers to carry out efficient and effective research, they need to to replicate systems, and to do it at commercial scale takes serious money and uh, serious resources and you know but that is necessary just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't do it you know if 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 we're to inform industry properly about um, efficiencies and developments I think it has to be on systems that are transferable it can't be on Aquaria for example it has to be on something that you know the likes of John are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis um, large commercial systems the research has to come out of similar systems to be applicable um, i don't know what you feel about that john or um it, it's interesting you should use the, the term similar systems because even uh, systems that have uh, a very similar design or uh, ostensibly the same design uh, will behave very differently um yes the the, the makeup water uh will all be different um and so there is um I think with novel species, having a very good look at the type of environments they live in in the wild, what sort of water quality parameters, uh, what range of water quality parameters that they'll they'll put up with, uh, is is probably the way to start with that one. But um, there is a danger that you that information is uh, information transfer between systems between academia and um, actual uh, production systems doesn't always translate 100% and you've always got to, to have one eye on that. Sorry Rod, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think this is a really good point and um, in a research facility like, like at universities, you, we can really precisely target and control variables of interest. Might be carbon dioxide, alkalinity, hardness, whatever it is, and therefore, and then replicate uh, within small tank systems so that we know very precisely in a statistically robust way the relationship between cause and effect, which is fantastic for, for biologists to then say to the to the producers, we think this is what you need to try and do or avoid or whatever. But as you say, when you replicate that on a commercial scale, there's lots of other things happen. So I have colleagues in Canada, for example, who recently invested in much more like a, it's not commercial scale, not that size, but more like commercial scale RAS. The trade-off they have is they can't replicate that 10 times for each treatment. So you, you reduce your statistical robustness when you're doing experiments within a more um, commercial scale setting. Um, so there's always that going to be that trade-off, but, but uh, we have to do both, I think. Do, do you think um, just with the development of feed formulations, the way things are progressing there, that that's going to have an effect on these systems and how they 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 run and are managed. You know, we, we see, um, you know, changes in diet composition are happening all the time. Uh, alternative sources of protein are being are being used. Is that going to have an effect on these existing systems? To go back to John's point about having to retrofit, is 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 there going to be changes at feed level which will have an effect on suspended solids within in systems? Um, Elena or or Frederick, do you want to touch on that maybe? Frederick. Uh, yes. Yeah, that, that that it's clear that the the, the feed formulation and the the, the physical uh, what we call feed technology is extremely important. 
but I would say still today, I mean, the, the end user the operator, uh, Colin John, is left <laughs> alone to figure out how to deal with the, the RAS feed is buying, for example, from different suppliers and change over time, improve over time. And the design they bought five years ago and they will still have for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, and, and there is a gap here and it's not easy to fill because it's it's a three three party. You know, um, I think that feed suppliers, when they de develop uh, RAS feed, they develop on the list of uh, criteria, you know, on how the feed, uh, the feed behave in the water, mostly to have more ballast uh, faces that stand better into the water, uh, improving the nutrient use uh, and re reducing the, the, the leaching and releasing of nutrients uh, by the feed itself or by how the fish transform it, mostly focusing on, on nitrogen, somehow phosphorus. And then the RAS designer uh, and suppliers, uh, they are not always talking closely enough uh, to RAS supplier. So just very short. We have example that uh, using a RAS feed in a RAS, uh, the faces were so much well shaped and sticky to really uh, hold together that they were stuck and, and they were clogging the, the outlet mesh of the, of the tank, of the fish tank itself. So they had no chance to, to, to reach the mechanical filters. So that's an example that uh, uh, feed supplier and equipment technology suppliers should talk a little more and together with the fish farmer, but because that's the operator who have the data on the daily data and experience on how a system is, is running. You know, we have seen expanse of nice and newly built and correctly designed RAS who goes into failure because not operating well. And we all have experience of uh, shitty RAS uh, and uh, do-it-yourself RAS, especially uh, 15, 20 years ago. That was doing the job with an operator dedicated to new every day and how to, what his system can do and can't do. So that's every partner needs to be involved. And I, I would say the, the operator, the farmer, uh, is the, the center there. Well, he, he, he and she is because they're paying for it ultimately, Frederick. Uh, John, do you want do you want to come in there? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think Frederick makes a, a, a very, very valid point there. Um, but to, to extend that further, it's um, it, it's also about how the feed's used. Uh, you've, got, you've got to try and ensure that all of that feed goes into the fish. Uh, you've got to have good distribution, both temporarily and spatially, because any of that feed that goes in the water that doesn't go into the fish is going to cause you an almighty problem. Um, and again, not all of the diets it, it, there are different feeding systems out there. For, for example, if you're using, we, we have one unit which uses a compressed air system. Um, so the, there's a danger there that you can get pellets fracturing. Obviously, the, the, uh, the, uh, the strength of the pellet has a, a hugely important role in that system with that feeding system. So it's you've really got to make sure that it all goes in the fish and it doesn't break up or you're not dumping it in one particular part of the tank thinking that you're feeding at the right rate, but actually what you're doing is underfeeding the tank and overfeeding the system at the same time. Elena, you want to make a point? Yeah, I just want to also connect to the previous session. I think Board was talking a lot about uh, precision feeding uh, and that that is something we haven't achieved, I feel, yet. It's a lot to do with the estimation that we still do because we cannot measure correctly the biomass in, in our tanks. So we are very often using just approximations from the table, feeding tables from different feed suppliers. Um, and we don't have a good way of actually checking the appetite of the fish. So we really, you really depend on the, the very skilled operators and people that have good experience to keep your feeding in balance. I mean, in sea cages, at least you have cameras, so people sit there in front of cameras and, and they can assess the, the, the appetite. But, but here in, in a RAS system, it is very difficult because you don't have ways of uh, seeing, you know, immediate effect of how you feed your fish. So talk about precision farming for our feeding and also you need to know what's your precise biomass in order to not underfeed or overfeed because I've heard sometimes some of the 
some of the feed uh, companies saying that you should maybe, and some producers, maybe you should underfeed your fish, you know, not to not to get into these problems. But but the fish is the main reason why we are using this system. So there's a definite uh, no no in in that uh, kind of uh, you know standpoint. So we, I feel we there's still a lot we can get better uh, at feeding. There's a comment here on the chat, you know, about the microbiome subject that obviously feed is the main factor for gut gut microbiome, whereas, you know, for skin and gills, it's more more water microbiota that has an effect on that. So you, you've got within the system, you've got obviously different uh, bacteria which are having a different effect on the fish and, and the water quality. Um, there's a question, what would happen if you continue dosing over time, i.e. keep the inoculant species relatively dominant in the system, not just a one-off inoculation for the salinity shift? Uh, I know that's a question kind of refers more to our, our salinity topic, which we'll, we'll, we'll cut to after the break. But maybe, Yelena, have you a, a view on that? You know, I have no experience with uh, with using this, like I said, uh, these type of products. Uh, but I feel that if you give if you give the system good time to establish the the stable uh, environment, uh, I still think that uh, the natural natural bacteria will prevail. Um, yeah, that's. But it's just my opinion. I don't have a, any documentation behind that. Rod, do you want to say something on that? Well, I'd just like to add, this is not my territory at all. So the microbiomes of, of biofilters and all the nitrification work they do is not my area. But talking recently with both producers and companies that work on uh, the solutions for, for ideal biofilters, they are saying, some of them are saying, that it's an essential thing to continuously inoculate, or rather they're advising that's a way forward because Often the nitrifying communities that do all the good work are, aren't the fastest growers and, and are outcompeted by the other things that you don't want. And so keeping them topped up on a regular basis is a kind of safe, secure way, they say, to maintain that consistently. And that makes even more sense if you're then changing parameters like salinity, for example, because you've got to adapt it to the right salinity tolerant strains of the microbes doing that. So not my area, but I do hear talking to other people. Then again, they are selling a product <laughs> that um, that might be the way to go. Everybody's selling something, Rod. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, the comment here, I think that species specific responses to water with suspended particles or other water parameters through different feeding behavior, filtering apparati connected to digestive systems, Opportunistic, opportunistic strategy and tolerance levels to water parameters should be considered before any high-tech solution is considered. Fish are not yet domesticated animals and belong to different species, conversely to, to terrestrial reared animals. Quite a long comment there, but I, I guess the, the point is that, you know, that they're complex organisms and that maybe they're not domesticated to the level of terrestrial animals, although they are domesticated and therefore, you know, that maybe more emphasis should be placed on that before we look at technical solutions to some of these issues. I guess that's more kind of a domestication question really, isn't it? Um, okay, just scrolling down here. Could you elaborate on why we can't use camera monitoring in RAS, please, Elena? Um, well, what I said is that uh, there is an issue with uh, visibility very often in, in RAS uh, tanks, but also even if you have a, a very clear and nice water, you have uh, very often deep tanks with lighting that comes either from the surface or, or in some cases you have uh, some sporadic uh, uh, subwater uh, lighting. But uh, normally uh, the visibility and what you can see so far was limiting uh, what was on the market. At least uh, the cameras that were on the market uh, were not functioning properly so that you could use them in such uh, conditions. So I know that there are new technologies coming up uh, when it comes to different uh, uh, cameras that might take on the, the challenge uh, that we see, especially in commercial systems. I mean. 
like we were discussing, we won't have maybe a problem to do that in a in a you know like a research facility where your tank is maybe one meter deep and you have no problems with your lighting and and let's say water quality. But in a in a larger tank with two hundred thousand fish um, and all the constraints I mentioned, it it might be a challenging thing to do still. And I know, John, you have some views on that in terms of fish uh, in water clarity before they go to sea. And the effect we, we might we will touch on that in maybe the RAS baggage section. Uh, I'm conscious of time here. We're going to we're going to take a short break for 10 minutes and um, just to allow our panelists get a, a cup of water or a coffee or something to keep them going. And we're going to come back and touch on the salinity topic and uh, RAS baggage uh, part of uh, Yelena's presentation. So if it's OK with everybody, we break for 10 minutes and come back. Thank you. So welcome back to session three. Um, we're on the final sprint now and um, we're just going to touch on two of the topics that Yelena uh, raised in her presentation, specifically salinity first and then and RAS baggage. Yelena, you could have, I suppose, picked any water parameter when you were thinking about this discussion. And, you know, you, you focused on salinity and you, you pose a very interesting question there, which was kind of subtle enough, but is, is, is a real, you know, I suppose, pressing question in terms of, you know, do we need to use salinity in post smalt production and maybe you might just outline your thoughts a bit on that. Yes, so so as I mentioned, uh, just the, the, the RAS environment allows us now to to produce fish or salmon in the ways we couldn't before. Um, and it's very clear to me that now two things we can talk about. We can talk about uh, grow out on land uh, these facilities that are now so popular and you hear so much about them uh, being built around the whole world where it really doesn't matter if you are in a in a in a desert somewhere uh, you can still grow salmon uh, but that kind of allows you to be independent a, a little bit on on the on the water quality and uh, and we have seen in us uh, let's say uh, fresh water has been used to produce uh, uh, salmon to to uh, slaughter sizes, uh, but uh, wrath or or salmon biology is different. Uh, we know how salmon lives. We know that salmon lives in the sea, and that's where they grow, and that's how we know them. But what we see now is that the biology is is being changed to fit the new type of system, like land based uh, facilities for grow out where you can choose uh, how you want to grow your fish. And apparently growing fish in freshwater allows you to kind of avoid some uh, risks like we have discussed and I mentioned, uh, both with efficiency of your water treatment, issues with uh, hydrogen sulfide. So in a way it's, it's easier. But on the other hand, this is not the environment that salmon is used to grow, be growing in. Um, and on the other hand, we have the post smalt production. So also, how are you going to produce your smalts? Uh, people don't go like they used to producing 100 gram fish, uh, smaltifying them and then putting them to sea. They are making bigger post smalts uh, up to 500 grams, a kilo or more. And then there is still, now we are still seeing that uh, the industry is still experimenting a little bit on how can they do this. Uh, is it just enough for the fish to be of a certain size and that kind of makes it ready for the sea? Is that good enough? Uh, or, or so I see that there's a lot of things happening just because we can do that right now in RAS systems. So for me, that's a very important question from the biological point of view and for the salmon welfare and, and health uh, point of view. So that's why I kind of raised it because we have, we have been seeing a lot of different things happening at the moment uh, now in salmon production. And I guess over the years with domesticated strains, the focus has been on how they perform at sea and grow out ultimately. And yes. with, with land reared salmon, 
um, you know, it, it's will the emphasis be on landlocked strains? Will it will it will it will it go into areas that up until now haven't been necessary? In terms we, of heard, we heard already that uh, breeding companies are talking us specifically about breeding programs for land based facilities where you can focus you know, because you have a better uh, overall uh, biosecurity and then therefore you can focus only in having strains that just, you focus just on growth and maximizing the growth while not looking into the health aspects that you normally have to look into if the fish is going further into the sea. So we are already seeing that that is actually the case right now, that we are already starting to adapt the biology of the salmon to fit this new way of producing the fish. And the same thing with the triploids, all females. Uh, we are trying to solve the issues that we saw that we had with biology in RAS. And therefore now we are trying basically to, to adapt the biology to fit uh, the production system. John, in your systems, you know, how do you manage salinity within the system? What, what operational, um, I suppose, methods do you employ to try and, and keep a control on? We don't. We don't use salinity to smaltify the fish. We don't. Um, in Shetland, we don't really have a sufficiently good uh, supply of, of cold, clear seawater to actually to do that. There would possibly be some issues with uh, the authorities and disease management as well. Um, so no, we don't. But it is it's 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 obviously it's a hot topic uh, globally. But for, for us, it's a bit of a no no. But that's not to say that salinity isn't important. We don't do post smalt at the moment. We're just um, producing. I would say standard size smalt, but I think I'll probably qualify that as more 150 to 200 gram fish in general. Um, I. I'm always very interested in, in just how sensitive these fish are to salinity. If you think, um, you know, in the wild, they manage to find their way back to their natal streams. They are extremely sensitive to their environment. Um, and we grow them to a stage well beyond that in terms of size and in terms of the speed that we do that and the environment we give them. Uh, and I think salinity is one of those things in systems like ours, not necessarily in post malt, but in systems like ours, it can go under the radar a little bit. You think, oh, we're not putting any salt in, no salinity, no signal. It's not true, not completely true. You can accumulate quite a lot of salinity just by putting in feed, by having uh, restricting your makeup, water going in, and then you can, without intention, change that. And you can send signals to the fish um, that you don't really realize you're doing. Uh, we've seen fish at below 50 grams, which haven't yet been smaltified, but which are seawater tolerant already. They, they're picking up on the cues that we give them. This might be because there's been a nitrite spike and we've used salt in the system mm -hmm. to, to, to you know, prevent this being an issue for the fish. Thinking entirely one dimensionally about the nitrite issue and not about the signal that we're giving to the fish. Um, and I, I do wonder whether we're giving them a lot more cues with things like very low levels of salinity that we ever really think of to start off with. And then, for example, you might take your unit, you might have fish smelt, we're about to smelt, and suddenly you add a lot more tanks, you bring a lot more makeup water in, and you suddenly drop your effective salinity. What signal is that sending to the fish at a time when you're actually trying to shove it in the other direction? I think it's... Um, I see but, indications. But you are using salt at different stages within the life cycle, up to what, 0.5? <laughs> yes and no, not in terms of smaltification. In terms of water, dealing with water treatment, you might well do it, for example, with fungus. Same thing, you, you, you might uh, be able to treat, uh, you might have a fungus issue, want to raise the salinity to, to, to deal with that. So all I'm saying is that there are, we are using it, we are using salinity to an extent, but we're focusing on, on what we're using that salinity to do without considering whether that has an unintended consequence, whether there's an interaction there Absolutely. with the fish or with other things in the environment that we're not fully aware of. And then our fish don't do what we think they should do. And we wonder why. OK, sure. Rod, have you any views on, on the effect of salinity on, on the fish? Uh, lots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of what I really like what John said because it's probably 
real to think that the smaller, smaller changes in salinity associated with the processes he talked about, adding a little bit of sodium chloride here and there as a water treatment issue or a protection against fungus or oomycetes, that could indeed be having an impact on, on, on the fish in terms of sensory information and readiness for going to see all that preparatory process. But one thing we do definitely know about from decades of work as physiologists is relatively small increases in salt level. So we're still talking freshwater, but saltier than normal freshwater, can uh, quite dramatically often improve physiological um, performance. So things like how an animal responds to high levels of carbon dioxide, or which changes its, its blood acid base balance, or how it responds to a sudden burst of exercise, which also changes its blood acid base balance. They can recover from those things much faster and using much less energy if there's just a little bit of extra salt around. So actually, I've always thought that these small increases in salt, you know, often used in these RAS systems, are likely to be a positive benefit to the animal physiologically, energetically, and therefore translate into healthier and faster growing fish. Um, so that, that all sounds quite positive to me, but that's not considering what, one, what John said, is what's the signal the fish is perceiving regarding where it might be going in the near future? Sure. Fre Frederick, I guess from a systems point of view, you prefer a system to be freshwater or full salinity. It's the halfway house is, is a difficult place to be. Yeah, yeah, if you take the extreme, but uh, not always. I mean, uh, I'm also a physiologist by background and uh, half, I, I will say. Uh, and this discussion is also start joining the discussion on the, the, the Hasbeck age or, you know, what you can call the history of the fish. Uh, salinity is a good example, you know. Um, Salmonid is uh, yeah, something quite unique, but it, it, it's lied to the, uh, the certain elasticity that the fish have to cope and adapt, if not acclimate with its environment, and the flexibility that we want the system to have. Uh, and salinity is a good example when you have a system with the, a batch of fish and during this production cycle, you will make a drastic change. Uh, it's not that common to do the same change with other uh, water parameters like temperature and, and, and so on. Um, starvation, you know, um, withdrawal of, uh, of feed for a certain period, and we all do that for a couple of days or sometimes more for market fish production uh, has an impact on the system. I mean, we, we, we need to remember that you have an active and biological uh, system and that we are raising at the same time sufficient uh, microbiota, a lot of complex uh, uh, organism. Um, and uh, the main question as uh, Yelena and Jan was, uh, they were raising is, uh, we are not sure what kind of fish we want to produce as small to post malt or large malt, and it will depend on uh, where they go after. Do they stay on land and go out? Do they go in uh, in cages in sea? Uh, at what age? At what time? Which location on earth? Uh, you know which kind of smalt we want to produce, and there is no. I don't expect we have a standard of the best malt ever. It will depend so much on the location, what will happen to this malt and all the history. It's already a fish that we are growing as the fastest as possible in terms of temperature. Uh, we are doing some artificial uh, action for the smaltification just to, to speed up the process or to control the process. Uh, the fish will smaltify, but in a farm, we want all the fish to smaltify at the same time. <laughs> And then sometimes we want to keep them up to one kilo uh, before they go into sea uh, in everything going from freshwater, brackish water to seawater. So that's all linked to the, the elasticity of the fish, which kind of fish we are producing for which uh, further uh, uh, use or production system and which kind of flexibility we, we want our system to have. Uh, we need uh, has, which is uh, robust and resilient and have enough flexibility. 
to uh, to scope with uh, some incident, but also some uh, dynamic we, we are giving into the system. Absolutely. Um, I'm go going to just revert to a few questions here, so please keep your questions coming in. We want to see these panelists sweat for the last half hour of this discussion. Put them under a bit of pressure. Uh, so what do you think about using artificial seawater? And I, I guess this comes into play with a lot of land-based systems now, um, Yelena. Will that eliminate some problems with salt water and still have the benefits? So, you know, in terms of making up artificial water versus uh, utilizing uh, natural seawater. Yes, I think John can also say a lot about that, but uh... Of course, it eliminates first uh, taking in uh, seawater in your facility. It's a, it's a biosecurity risk, and uh, no matter how good sometimes you you uh, you treat your intake water, there's still some level of risk that you might take some pathogens in. So that's one thing. Another thing is just uh, the sulfate levels in the seawater that you are if you are taking it in, and especially if you're using brackish water or or seawater, of course. Uh, then that risk, of course, increases. Not saying that the mass mortalities will happen, but just on the side of increasing the risk. For sure, you could uh, maybe sleep better if you use uh, the artificial salt, but it's it's a, it's a costly business. Uh, and I think, John, you, you know better maybe, uh, you know, how much that costs you, basically. Uh, just to, to follow that on, yeah, you would need to have uh, very high intensity research, very low uh, introduction of makeup water. Doable, um, but possibly if you want gin clear water as well, a bit of a contradiction there. Um, it, it, I guess, and also to an extent, it depends how high you want to raise the salinity to. But not cheap, that's for sure. And and the thing, uh, the other thing is that um, yes, you are probably at less of a risk of hydrogen sulfide because you're not using uh, seawater with a very high level of sulfate. But that's not to say that your system won't generate sulfate from from introductions within it. Um, and also, uh, fresh water can contain it as well. Ours does. Uh, and over time that can accumulate. So it's um, it's something else to be aware of. You wouldn't blindly go, oh, we're not using seawater, so we won't have a problem with hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, there was a question earlier. Uh, I just can't see it quite now, but it relates to this in terms of, you know, high levels of nitrate within the system and, and the effect on fish. You know, obviously with systems that might use artificial seawater, they're going to take in less makeup water and then nitrate may become an issue. Um, is there is there much studies around that, Yelena, in terms of, I think the question was about what's the effect of, you know, sorry, 200 ppm of nitrate on Atlantic salmon post -mult. So, So John Davison and, and the Gunner Group in Freshwater Institute have done one study up to 100 milligram per litre and, and that is what went quite well. So, um, and as like you say, it's, it's uh, you have to really run your systems very tight in order to go into such a high concentration of nitrite. And now in the recent years also, you know, like with this H2S uh, uh, issues that occur, uh, there have been some suggestions that actually having uh, nit uh, nitrite in your system can protect you from the H2S uh, toxicity. So I think nitrate was not ever debated as a, as a, as a big issue for salmon so far. Uh, so, but I haven't seen any studies that went up to 200 milligram per liter. I want to move on to the RAS baggage uh, discussion. I, there's a comment here, and I think this probably sums up, you know, the difficult task that Yelena has had. Uh, I'm surprised there hasn't been discussion about RAS environment and early Atlantic salmon maturation. So I suppose, you know, in looking at this subject, Elena, you could have picked, I don't know, 50 different topics to, to really try and address, you know, and we you've you've picked three. Uh, we're, we're about to move on to the last one, but maybe just a quick comment there on about salmon maturation and uh, so, particularly in yeah. rice. 
So, so uh, I think uh, we want to also leave some teasers for the 2022, you know, it's like people have to have something to discuss in two years time. So we didn't want to kind of uh, pick up all the topics. We just picked a couple and, and, and we already talk a lot about that. So, so I'm sure we, we can come back to a lot of these things uh, next time around when we have this workshop. But just to, to mention to, to John that asked this question, I know they have been working quite zealously in, in, in US in in, in, um, in Freshwater Institute to look into the maturity issue and that's been a big uh, issue and and uh, I think it's it's not one thing that that causes uh, this uh, maturation it can be many different factors and again in a complex environment right like, like RAS I don't know if we have touched on all the potential factors that can attribute to maturation but I think that specifically the combination of um, light temperature uh, and water quality or salinity maybe has something to do uh, with this uh, together. So and specifically use of temperature and I, I know it's not so easy to, te to be, you know, when you're tempted to have uh, already higher temperatures in, in RAS, which you do just by running your systems. It's very tempting not to use this opportunity to get better growth, but but we are really kind of pushing hard uh, salmons in RAS with, with 24 hours of light and, and, and potentially higher temperatures uh, to grow. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, I think fish feel that they are ready uh, to, to go spawning, basically. So, so yeah, so we are still uh, debating on, on all the potential reasons for it, but uh, John knows more about it, uh, I think, than I do. So maybe next time around. Maybe, maybe next time. So just moving on to the RAS baggage, I think it's very well uh, labeled topic. Um, I, I'm going to put this to John Walden first, because obviously, you know, whenever there's a problem at sea, it's your fault, John, because you didn't produce the most fantastic smolt to ever leave a RAS system. Uh, in terms of it was mentioned earlier about water clarity being, for example, one thing where, you know, you might have a system where there's there's a level of colour and then fish are moving into a, quite a clear environment and that can have an, an, an effect. And I, I know it, John Richmond mentioned earlier as well, the idea of maybe recording the sound of feeders at sea and playing it in the hatchery to you know, so somehow get the fish used to that transfer. But it, whichever way you do it, it's it's a big step moving fish to sea. And, you know, how you as as a hatchery um, producer enable those fish to perform as, as, as well as they can when that movement takes place. Um, yes, I mean, uh, and sometimes seawater does have a point, uh, but certainly not all the time. I, I think that you think about a RAS system from a, from a sensory point of view, it's quite a sterile environment. There's not a lot of change in there. Lights go on, lights go off. That's about it really. Temperature might go up and down, but it doesn't have the same uh, level of stimulus as putting fish out in the scene. And obviously, if you are on a research uh, system with highly colored water, you've maybe got the fish on 24 hour light before they go out. And then you might well be putting them into a very, very clear environment um, where there is a lot of sensory information going on, there may be predators about, there'll be certainly changes in light levels, um, not necessarily the summer either, because in the summer, yes, the sun's out more and it's a bit brighter and stronger, but you've got more algae to soak up that light intensity in the middle of winter when you've got really cold weather and the sea's really clear, you can get some bright days and suddenly you're putting fish from very dark conditions into very bright conditions and quite often they, they don't like it. Yes, the, this this topic of baggage is, is, is very relevant because um, on many occasions you see fish go out of research systems and they literally sulk for six to eight weeks after they go out. They just don't, um, they don't really come on at all. And um, John Richmond made a, a very interesting point this morning, which I can also echo, is that the difference in behavior between uh, lock fish and uh, and ras fish because although we don't have our own lock sites we do buy from external suppliers who do um, so I do always wonder whether we provide a slightly too cosseted uh, environment in the ras system 
to and then we just put the fish out into um, an environment which for want of a better term scares the hell out of them. The other thing is, of course, that you will have just smolted them, uh, probably got them on a 24 hour photo period, and you're now going to put them back onto not necessarily a 1212, but a light and dark cycle. So again, there's maybe confusion going on there. Quite how you get around that, I'm I'm not sure, but I think that this is a, uh, certainly for a lot of RAS fish, this is a very big issue. Elena, do you want to come in there maybe and just kind of tease out some of the, the, the things you had in mind in terms of RAS baggage and, and pick up on what John said there? Yeah, so, so that's, I think that's becoming more and more evident basically the area where where I see that we need to know more we need to we need to research more because I mean when we started doing research on RAS in our facility uh, normally you know your research stops when when you're done in, in your RAS system you're very seldom then put your fish further on into into the sea cage or into that environment to actually see what is the the effect of what you have done in, in RAS and and it's only when we have done uh, uh, one uh, one uh, study that I showed that Trina has done, where we have actually produced molds in different ways and put them to the sea and followed them all the way to the slaughter size that we actually see that what you conclude for us phase not necessarily has to uh, be the case for the for the duration of the production in sea. And this is, this is still where your fish will spend most of their time. Uh, and this is still, when you talk to some of the producers, they still see, you know, hatchery is just a, one smaller part of where your biomass grows is actually in the sea. So, so that would be more relevant uh, part of your production, so to say. So, so I'm, I'm a little bit now more cautious also whenever we approach research to to uh, to say something about you know like what are the situations uh, what is the situation in, in in sea cages afterwards because that's that's what you have to really look into how do you prepare the fish and as like Frederick said also you produce fish in a different way you have you put them in the sea at different seasons in different locations it can be up here in Norway in Finnmark all the way up north. Uh, you can put it, put them out at different temperatures and, and different day lengths. How can we really produce them so that we hit right spot when they need to go into the into the cages? So that was my kind of, you know, the, the, the basically I have no, I don't have all the answers at all. I think we really need to work hard to get more answers uh, on this topic. I guess, you know, no more than, you know, in the natural environment, you know, as we mentioned a few times, you know, salmon certainly are undergoing those changes and able to adapt to the different systems. And it's about trying to ensure that the systems that we produce the fish in, you know, there's a bit of variability there that we can use. I don't know, Frederick, if you if you have a view on that in terms of how how a system can best prepare a fish for for leaving to what what is an essentially a completely different environment. Uh, well, yeah, well, it's, it's not an easy question, uh, but, but it's it's clear it's a good example. And for example, talking about uh, salmon production, uh, we probably want to produce a totally different uh, small and post malt for either they are going to to go on sea in that pen at what time, or they will stay all their life in land. Uh, up to market size, you know, uh, either freshwater, brackish water, seawater, you can name it. Uh, that's all the question of the interaction between the fish and its, its environment. It's not easy to, to study. Uh, if you take other parameters, let's say we are talking about uh, maximum yeah. level of nitrate. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some question previously about CO2. Uh, ammonia, you can mention it. A lot of academic approach and studies, uh, for example, CO2, they, they will study for a few weeks or months, you know, on the maximum, let's say 12, 15, 20, and say that, yeah, for this fish that has been uh, submitted uh, for uh, three months, I mean, 15 is better and 10 is probably better than 12 and 8 will be even better. Yeah. But in the reality, uh, most of the farm, you never run uh, on a daily basis, uh, full time at the peak biomass, peak density and peak system, you know, you have always some fish in and fish out. 
uh, even in grow outs, even for marine fish, you know, you need to give some place for the fish to grow. So you start with a reasonable uh, density and you build up in biomass until you you grade the fish, you transfer the fish, you split the fish or you start harvesting. Mm -hmm. and, and for smalt and post smalt, it's a very good example where people are working more on the batch mode, batch in, batch out. You know, and in between, they take the opportunity to empty the tank, clean the tank, uh, refill the tank. So, uh, so that means we have a dynamic environment for the fish, staying a few weeks, eight, twelve weeks, you know, up to four months into a system before they move into a next either has department, which is clean, <laughs> and we lower the biomass, and they restart with low level of CO2 and whatever you can name it, ammonia, or they go into very challenging different environment like a, a different production system like net pen so it's more in the big edge I'm, I'm more understand this dynamic we don't have the fix on the, the fish uh, produce all their life in a sweet spot optimal or sub optimal parameters that we try to control and monitor with uh, automation all the time they are always adapting and acclimating on the environment and that's the flex this flexibility we need to have and also a better understanding on the fish physiology. A question here um, from an attendee. With respect to RAS baggage, I was wondering about the muc mucosal uh, microbiota of the fish. Is anything known about the effect the transfer to sea cages has on the respective microbiota of the fish, gut or gill and skin? Could the microbiota of the fish remain influenced by the RAS environment after transfer as a sort of baggage too? Elena, you might be able to address that. So I know that there's a lot of work currently going on on actually looking into the into this uh, aspects, um, and we have worked uh, quite a lot in Afima on on the skin quality, for example, not directly related to microbiota yet, but uh, and we do see the how uh, some is sensitive in this phase and the skin quality is very sensitive in this phase when, when they're smoltifying and, and moving from one, uh, one facility or one system to another. But, um, but of course, skin has their own microbiota uh, that is absolutely affected uh, by, the, by the environment. Um, and of course, I would believe that they, they can take, uh, this can really affect uh, the fish uh, very much and uh, one of my colleagues and uh, Christian Carlsen has been working now and looking into how can maybe uh, some probiotics also affect uh, the fish when moving uh, skin uh, microbiota, how, how they affect the fish uh, skin and, and the performance after transfer to sea. So I see a lot of research coming on uh, exactly on this topic in the future. Excellent. And there's another question about, um, is there any knowledge about recirculation of pheromones and other signal substances from fish and wrasse and the risk that this uh, could influence further performance, smoltification, maturation, etc.? So we, we know a lot again from uh, from John and, and Chris and, uh, and their group in Freshwater Institute, uh, especially about steroid hormones in relation to maturation. But uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, others. Uh, but I don't think there was always uh, such a good correlation between how much uh, hormones do you have in the water and the, the level of maturation. So I think the things there are not very straightforward. Um, and we know that uh, certain organic matters like this accumulate in, in RAS, but I think we still don't know enough to say very specifically what are their uh, effect on the fish further on in, in, in sea cages. Sure, and, and I guess, you know, that's the thing about RAS is that, you know, a system that's 10 years old is going to operate differently than a system that's two years old. And, you know, we don't really know enough about the buildup of these compounds and the effect it would have on fish in systems that you know have been operating 15 20 years um I, I guess rod you know you know compounds like that could be having a discernible effect on a fish population without us even being aware of it they certainly can uh, steroid hormones in particular are well known to get into the fish from the aquatic environment when, when they're available at sufficient concentration. So, so there's plenty of evidence of that. So 
There's lots of studies on oest oestrogenic chemicals, not just oestrogen, but oestrogen-like chemicals in the natural environment, in rivers, for example, that get into fish and cause feminization of otherwise male fish. So there's plenty of evidence of that. Um, I think I'm not so in touch with evidence of those molecules surviving long term in RAS. There's, there's, I've seen some papers on testosterone, for example, being measured and accumulating, but what the effects they have on the fish in the RAS, uh, I'm not sure of or whether there are papers showing those effects, if there are any. Frederick, you want to come in there on that point? Uh, yeah, and we, we need to, you know, when we, we talk about Haas environment and fish health and welfare, uh, we, we, we tend sometimes to think too much as uh, individual one fish in this environment. And, uh, and we, we need to think, especially in terms of welfare and when we start to talk about interaction, uh, we need to think of the group. You know, when we talk about pheromone and I think you, you probably have a more, uh, more effect on some stress uh, trigger in a group of fish when they communicate somehow together, especially in a close environment and challenging environment in terms of uh, density, number of fish in, in, in the same uh, a fixed uh, volume of water. So everything which is linked to health and welfare need to be considered, uh, of course, as individual, but as group. And you have a, a totally different level of study and on the interaction on the group. Uh, that can go as well or that can go very bad that uh, yeah there is a lot to to do there also there's three questions here which are kind of linked uh one about maybe uh, and i might ask john to comment on this first you know exposing smolts to uh, flow for example for a few weeks before they go to sea um and then there's a question about is there a difference between smolts from ras and smolts from traditional flow through systems and then a third question about semi-closed containment systems, about using them as a, as a maybe, you know, an intermediary environment or a nursery environment. Uh, I know Yelena would have a lot of experience with that, but I might just ask John first in terms of, and you kind of touched on it there, the difference between lock grown smolts and, and ras smolts, you know, is, is there potential or is it something that you would consider? Is that exposing your smolts to a higher flow rate, for example, before they go to sea? If we're talking about, um, <clears throat> it's actually, uh, this, this is quite interesting. If we're talking about flow rate in terms of water speed, um, there's a very interesting one here because, of course, the, the lock fish, or at least the ones we buy, they're not exposed to much in the way of water velocity at all. And yet those fish will quite often do better than our restock fish in uh, high energy sites at sea. So it's not, uh, certainly for those fish, not having any prior training of strong flows has not hampered them at all. Whereas those fish coming from the RAS, where they actually do, we do give them a bit more water speed. It's maybe not making that much of a difference. There is a big difference um, between RAS fish and lock fish in my experience. Um, the behavior is very different. Um, whether a semi-closed containment system at sea is a good halfway house, yes, it might well be. It might well be that you do need to consider, uh, taking it from a different point of view, whether all of your fish are suitable for all of your sites, whether you, you might want to tailor which fish go to which sites if you have the, the option between lock and, uh, and, and ras fish. So I think um, the semi-closed is an interesting one because it maybe does provide that halfway house, but obviously you need to have suitable facilities, suitable locations and hydrology for that. Uh, and it's maybe not for, for, for everyone. Yelena, I know you've done a lot of work in Norway around this, about the use of semi-contained systems as a kind of intermediary phase. Yeah. I think uh, it's more and more people see this as a, as a, as a alternative to RAS, actually, uh, not just as a, as a stepping stone to the open sea cages, uh, because uh, of course you can uh, you can be, be shown in many many studies that you can really grow your fish without having their lice issues and and that you still get a very good growth uh, in in those systems and that was. That was a general idea once they were introduced in Norway to, to try to protect the fish of that size. It, 
in their most, uh, you can say, sensitive phase in life to, to prepare them for, this, for the sea. So, of course, that could be a step one step further into an open cage, but I also see it as, a, as an alternative way to grow uh, your cosmos uh, compared to, to us. And you will still have a lot of differences uh, when moving fish in, uh, in semi-closed, just to talk about the light. I mean, uh, the, the level of light, no matter how strong the light we choose, uh, you never achieve the level of intensity that you achieve in, 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 in sea cages. It's, it's not possible. It's not economically responsible. Um, so just that one factor, for example, would be very much different uh, from RAS and, and then on to the anything you use outdoors, basically. Um, but when it comes to difference between flow trend, and I'm, I'm happy you mentioned the velocity, John, because we did a study when we tried to compare to produce salmon in a small team in RAS versus flow through. And basically what our conclusion was that there were no differences, but then again, the, the flow we provided to the fish that were grown in a, uh, in a, in a flow through system was maybe something that was not common for a, a flow through system and the way you operate it where you don't have enough water, for example. So, so we had the same velocities and we had the very similar water quality and then we didn't get any differences when it comes to the growth or smoltification, uh, for example, but, but the way people operate uh, uh, flow through systems might be different and actually the velocity is one of the aspects that uh, we need to mention uh, in, in relation to training and uh, uh, that is very different uh, in flow through systems today even I would say um, and in, in RAS systems. You touched on something there Yelena uh, and I think it might be worth we have a few minutes just to maybe discuss the topic of training, you know, about training of staff in RAS systems. And, you know, is there enough emphasis put on that? Because I know, um, not saying Frederick would say this, but a lot of RAS system providers would say that their systems aren't being managed effectively or that the staff aren't being trained efficiently to run them. So I, I don't know how the panelists feel about that subject. You know, it, is this something we need to place more emphasis and focus on? Uh, I would say absolutely. And uh, and I think uh, me being at university right now is, is a good example where industry came together and, and said, OK, we, we will need to finance a position. We need uh, people to start taking this very seriously. We need to make uh, places where not just new generation, but existing industry can get the, the current knowledge and, and can learn how to operate the systems. And, and I also know, and Frederick can probably corroborate that, that if you are buying a new system, your system supplier will also provide you with some, some courses and, and will explain how things are operated and will provide, uh, you know, service uh, throughout probably quite a bit of the first production um, cycle, if not longer. So, so I absolutely see that, and that's one of the topics that's been mentioned quite a lot now with this explosion of of, of the land-based systems. That you cannot just walk on the street and then find somebody that knows how to grow your fish, you know. So, uh, so definitely that that uh, there is a, a lot of experience and art in, in doing so. So, so we, I see absolutely that we need to work much more on, on, on getting better and giving opportunity to, to the industry. I think industry is quite hungry for these opportunities to, to, to learn how to work better and how to grow their fish better. John, we, we, we all want a turnkey system that does exactly what it says on the tin, but it, it doesn't exist. You know, you need you need systems, as you as you mentioned earlier, the, the exact same system will perform differently in different settings. And you know, how do you, you know, as a as a production manager, set about training your staff, keeping them up to speed with developments, you know, ensuring that they're operating your systems as efficiently as possible. Um, <clears throat> this is a very tricky one. Obviously, the world of world of RAS is is very much more multidisciplinary than 
uh, traditional fish farming. Uh, I heard the comment earlier that the, the next generation needs training. I, I think some of the current generation could do with a bit of training too. Um, it is difficult to to convey to new members of staff the biology and the traditional side of things. Yes, not a problem. Uh, this is how to grow fish. But when it comes to setting up tanks, velocities, hydrodynamics, um, you know, at the moment, I've not seen that much coming through in the way of courses on that. Uh, and I, I think that is a, an area um, that I'm sure is being addressed by by people like Yelena. Um, that we we do have that knowledge gap there, and it is difficult to to um, to bring new staff up to speed fully. But of course, you do. There's no substitute for learning your own system. Um, it will behave differently. It will have its quir um, quirks, and um, and unfortunately, there's no real. Well, I suppose the only shortcut is to to maintain experienced staff who know these things. But it, it's not easy. That's for sure. Frederick, I'm sure you have a view on this topic. Um, yes, uh, it's um, yeah. Experience is uh, is important. Training, yeah, but it's uh, it, it, it's not enough. I mean, you you need to have closer cooperation between all uh, the stakeholders there, and you know, of course, the operators. Uh, we mentioned the, the tech, yeah, uh, designers and uh, equipment or technology suppliers that may be different uh, from the designers, uh, feed suppliers. Uh, academic uh, veterinary uh, authorities uh, to understand. I mean, uh, a RAS is, is, is a production system. It's a specific production system and you need at least for the daily operators which are there <laughs> and have to deal with it day and night. They need to have a good uh, understanding on the, what it can do and what it can't do and how you have to adjust and to react. Uh, we had an interesting session before about automation and monitoring. Yeah, it's not answering uh, everything, but we, we, we need to have some, not enough data, but we need to have in information, some predictive trending information that you, you can you, you can see. I mean, typically, uh, even a good farmer, uh, you will start to push the red button when you start to have uh, uh, a significant change in the behavior of, the, of your fish, you know, loss appetite, swimming behavior, or when you start to have some mortality or let's say some mark and see, you can identify some stress in, in your group of fish. And I don't say it's too late, but we uh, we should have anticipated that before, you know, we, we need, uh, as we say, there is, uh, RAS need have need to have a stable a stable environment. As we see, we are playing sometimes all the nature around or, or other things play on this environment and how stable it is. Uh, you can't be on the sweet spot and sweet line all the time from the egg to the slaughter. So you will always fluctuate in a kind of comfort zone, and we need to be able to read that. Uh, yeah. At least the operator need, needs. And it's linked to uh, the knowledge we know on the physiology of the fish, uh, the input we have as the feed, but also the equipment we have to, to deal with this water and deal with the fish, you know, also transport of fish, grading of fish, vaccination. I mean, all, all that in one. It's, uh, it's a lot of multidisciplinary knowledge that need to be built. Uh, it, is there enough consideration given in system design towards those, you know, operational procedures that happen, you know, vaccination, for example, grading of fish, you know, and, you know, the effect that that has momentarily maybe, but on the system, you know, is there is there enough consideration given though to those management procedures that have to take place within the system? Uh, yes, to some, yeah, to some extent. I mean, all, uh, I think all professional, um, uh, equipment or technology suppliers uh, spend some time uh, early in a project uh, with the client to understand exactly how they want to to use the system. Uh, you can go also through a risk assessment uh, session, you know, uh, all the what if uh, and to really understand. I mean, it's um, it's you really need to understand how the the farmer will will use the system operate the system move fish grade the fish 
Uh, if you have a system with uh, six tank, will you use the six tank all the time or sometimes only two tank? And then you have a very lower velocity in the in the piping. You you, you disturb everything, and some of your system, uh, like degassing or even mechanical filtration, may not be optimized. You know, uh, in in water industry, uh, when you you work on a project, you always work on a mass balance with a minimum average, maximum flow and capacity. And in RAS, for a long time, we have always thought about maximum. So sometimes we are in trouble, we are not operating at the maximum. And sometimes the startup, when you start with your brand new system and just through a small amount of fish, there you start to have problem because your system was designed for just driving full speed. Yeah, I, I see John nodding in agreement there. Um, Yelena, you wanted to come in there, did you? Yeah, just um, something in relation to this uh, handling procedures and, and uh, operations that we do. I have to say, it's, uh, we really took a lot of things straight uh, from the uh, floater systems without even considering what this means in RAS facilities. And it's, it's strangely enough, but we are currently having a project with uh, Nofima and, uh, and the Institute for Marine Research where we are actually looking into uh, how to starve the, f the fish in RAS and what, the, what are the consequences of starving fish in rust and how does that affect the stability of your system? So maybe you will find this that, that kind of it's 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 quite incredible that we don't know these things already. But uh, but you know with this new environment we focus so much on what is new, but we also have to go back and look at things that we know from traditional farming that we just took for granted and took in into these new systems. But it's not that easy because that also has effect on, on our systems and eventually on, on the fish that we're growing. That's a really good point. Rod, Rod, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I'd just like to add to the, to the points being made about or the questions being asked about training and educating the personnel who are going to be running RAS. So if we look at the global picture, we're being told by the FAO that we've got to double pretty much aquaculture production by, is it 2050, to meet the demand? Uh, the, the question is how? So we're already running RAS, but when I, I've been to, visited or collaborated with people on pretty much every continent who run RAS. And on these visits, you'll see they're doing something, they're adding this particular compound or using this particular method. And I'll often say, oh, that's interesting, why are you doing that? And the usual answer is, because so-and-so told me. They don't know the reasons why or the logical progression that led to that. And I think we, we always need to compare ourselves with terrestrial agriculture. We're way behind in terms of how advanced we are. It's, it, you know, aquaculture is, or intensive aquaculture at least, is a really young discipline. And we're at that kind of early part of the, the learning curve, um, which is really exciting, but it also means we've got an awful lot to learn. And we've got to do the research to find the answers. And then we've got to train and educate the people that are going to become the experts to be, be running it in the future. So it's a long way to go, but that training and that research to get those answers is absolutely key to the way forward. It's really good points, very well made, Rod. Um, I think we're, we're coming towards the, the conclusion of the workshop, but I just wanted to give the panelists a final opportunity maybe to, to, to deliver a key take home message if they could. Um, not, not just on obviously the session we've done, done now, but over the whole day, what they feel is an important point to make in terms of, of RAS technology going forward. Um, I might start with Elena, if you don't mind, please. That's no, no problem. <laughs> so, so I think we've discussed quite a lot of issues. And like we said, this is a to be continued uh, story. And uh, I'm glad that the IS is taking this um, initiative. So, so what is my take home message is that regardless of which system we are using, our, our main priority is an excellent health and welfare of the fish that we are producing. And that has to be the, the start and the end of all of our thoughts uh, that we have on, on how we are producing things. And uh, as like I said, we see now that 
that the, the RAS uh, topic is branching out a little bit and we might see different aspects that are relevant for grow out systems compared to the systems that are still producing just molten and and and, um, and post molten of course the biology that we're talking about might be different but uh, this is something that is currently happening in the world and and in the end i think ras is a very complex environment and like uh, chris good mentioned earlier it is still evolving so uh, so this environment is also changing so we're just getting to know to know it, but by the time we maybe get to know it, it will change. So it's it's a work in pro, uh, progress, but uh, keep the biology in mind uh, at all times. Thanks, Yelena. Frederick? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, uh, with, with, with Yelena. I mean, the, uh, sometimes we, we, we forget that in uh, we are farming. We are farmers, you know. We, we need to keep that in mind. So even we we, we are dealing with a larger and larger system, uh, a lot of automation because of the scale of the, the operation and the, the technology involved. Uh, we are looking at a lot of stakeholders into this project coming from uh, um, investment group, you know, developers more than farmers. Uh, and sometimes in all the discussion we, we, we have, or we can have around RAS and aquaculture, uh, we, we may forget the fish. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's important to, to keep in mind that uh, RAS technology, we are dealing with a complex environment where probably the microbiota is as important as the fish itself in terms of physiology and coping with the biological part of the environment. So even when we talk about water quality parameters and, and so on. So we, we need really to, to take care of that, to find the right balance uh, and to train or to have the people uh, aware of that uh, on the way they, they approach this and they operate the system, but also the design system. You know, you uh, we see especially in in the sectors of technology and equipment suppliers. Uh, we see a lot of people coming from different industry, bringing some new application. Um, it's it's not that easy. So that's I think it's really yeah the take home message is that we we need always to, to think of the whole picture and to keep the fish uh, uh, in the middle and health and welfare. It's not only in terms of uh, best water quality uh, disinfection, uh precision feeling yes it's part of that uh but it's much more and uh, like far in farming the experience you build uh living and sleeping with your fish almost <laughs> uh it's something you can't buy uh so it have to take a more important part of the whole uh, whole process thanks frederick rod Yeah, I'd just like to make the point that we need to be encouraging and training the next generation of people that are going to become aquaculture scientists and practitioners <clears throat> using RES to produce all this seafood that we, we want to get. And they've got to be people that are really good at very broad holistic thinking. So whilst the fish biology is at the center of it all, they've got to be good at that. They've got to be good at water chemistry, a big data handling, understanding markets, engineering of the hydraulics of the system. Um, th that's that's where we got to have a really well educated group of people running the science behind it and the practical aspects of running RAS in the future. Do, do you think we're, we're probably asking too much of people sometimes? You know, it, you know, it's often said a fish farmer is obviously a farmer, but an electrician, a plumber, a scientist, yeah. you know, in so many different roles. That, that's true, you know. but of course, we're not really talking about a single person for a single RAS. It'll be a team that collectively have that, but ideally they've all got an understanding of everybody else's expertise. Sure. Yeah, yeah. John, I'll give you the final word there. Uh, it's obviously <clears throat> three very good comments that are kind of difficult to follow. What I would say, it, it, it's it's obviously a very exciting time um, to be in RAS, uh, and we should be excited by this. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of mysteries to solve out there, and um, 
and it's a point was maybe touched on earlier today, but I, I'd like to just stress it a little bit more. We generate uh, an awful lot of data and we spend very little time looking at that data. And in that data, probably some answers to questions we've got. Um, and we should be digging down into it and, and making time to dig down into it. It tends to get lost in the hurly-burly of everyday life and you end up doing it in your spare time. It's not very productive. We should really be um, approaching our data and, and looking, mining it for, for all we can get from it. So um, yeah, I think that's uh, the only thing that's I have to add on this. A really good point. I, look, I want to thank all the panelists for for, their, uh, for taking part in, in this session and really contributing to a, a really engaging conversation and um, it made my job very easy so i want to thank rod frederick uh, john and elena who also did the presentation and stimulated a lot of the conversation so thanks very much guys for all your efforts i'm going to hand over to Hervé now who's going to sum up uh, and close the workshop thank you Okay, thank you to all. So I'm, I'm going to try to wrap up uh, these uh, three sessions, which is uh, a bit challenging. I try to keep it short. Uh, I know it's been a long day. It's been a very interesting day for me, I'm sure for all of us. So first, I need to thank everybody for their contribution. Uh, the attendance has been a great first Ross workshop, I believe. It's been very inspiring. A lot of topics have been covered. We had a total of uh, up to 230, 240 uh, participants uh, during the day, which uh, I think is really good. Uh, I found the discussion very interesting. And what actually strikes me uh, the most is the lack of standardization, really, that we find overall in RAS, um, especially for we've seen disinfection, for monitoring, uh, for any kind of the sensing equipment they use, uh, but also later on in the last session, as it was demonstrated. And this is due also to the range of systems that are used, because we always speak about RAS, but actually there's many, many different types of RAS that are being used, depending on the technology um, that people have been selecting or how old the systems are. And also for the species, we've been focusing a lot on salmon um, for obvious reasons, but obviously there are lots of species around the world that are being farmed um, in uh, recirculation. So this makes things a bit tricky. Um, that's especially true for salmon, uh, when I think about the lack of sanitization, which is quite striking, because there's so much more data available than in any other species. But I guess that might also be part of the problem. Um, the volume of data probably is not really what is required here. Um, so given on the, the level of investment uh, that is ongoing at the moment, um, I think this is clearly a top priority. Um, and uh, a collaborative effort really is needed. And also understanding, when I come back to the, um, the session on disinfection, understanding uh, the effect of the disinfection on the biofilters, uh, on the microbiome, and microbiota, also fish, because we cannot forget about fish. And it was really nice at the end to come back to the fish. At the end of the day, uh, it's great to have all this uh, fantastic technology, but it is all about farming fish. So the biology really is important. So fish immunity, for example, is really also very important. And I'm sure that we can bring uh, this topic uh, in the next event. So in the disinfection uh, section, there's been a lot of interesting questions and comments uh, that came up. One of them is, um, um, should we actually disinfect regularly? Is it required when we have a system that is biosecure? I mean, that was a question that is, I think, very interesting. Uh, how do we monitor the efficiency of the disinfection? That was another one also that's important because it's uh, traditionally uh, done, as we've seen, uh, through the autotrophic um, uh, counts, but obviously uh, there's limitation to this. And how much disinfection should be done or could be done? How, how and importantly, the fish. Um, a little bit was said about alternatives to the uh, usual treatments like uh, UV, uh, ozone, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, parasitic acids. Uh, but I think probably there's uh, much more to be done uh, in, this, uh, in this topic. So there are more questions than answers, as usual, uh, but it's mainly due to the broad range of systems also in, in, in species that we are applying RAS. Importantly, as it was mentioned during the session, um, and I, I've been taking some uh, notes on this, um, RAS loop disinfection is only part of the integrated disinfection protocol. So it's quite important in the RAS. So that includes also the egg disinfection, the equipment disinfection, the disinfection throughout, the biosecurity throughout. 
So, of course, if you don't have these other elements, then probably this infection might actually not be able um, uh, to um, deal with the problem. The following session on data automation, acquisition, um, and integration um, was also very interesting, highlighting key questions and considerations for the future of precision farming in aquaculture. And it is clear that a lot remains to be done also. Uh, some key thoughts that were discussed during the session uh, include uh, what kind of data should be collected really, why the data should be collected, and how often it should be collected, and at the end of the day, to do what? Because it was really interesting to hear the comments from the panelists that I think every farm using RAS at the moment has got lots and lots of hard disk full of data, but that's not really useful <laughs> by itself. So I think it's really interesting um, um, thinking uh, and, to, and the most critical point, I believe. The sum source or calibration uh, and the data integration that remain very challenging. Um, and um, but they are key to collect informative data and identify also um, the uh, interactions that will be promoting efficient performances. A lot of the discussion also was um, clearly um, speaking about the automation that is done mainly for tank cleaning and fish feeding. Um, although there's still more that needs to be done for this. But what about the fish behavior and the fish welfare? There's a lot of development in open sea cages for this, but it doesn't seem to be so much yet when it comes to um, enclosed RAS system. And there are obviously, uh, there's been discussion about reason why uh, it's not so easy to monitor fish uh, in, in the tanks. Overall, the lack of standardization uh, in the monitoring uh, in the data uh, make it very difficult to understand the multifactorial uh, trends in a species specific manner. This is really the big challenge here. Monitoring without safe limits or sweet, sweet spots, as we, we heard uh, several times, uh, might not be very useful, um, but the monitoring and the reliable data that can be used to identify the biological threshold first, yeah then we are allowed to automate the system. So I think at some point it might be, um, I have a feeling, is a personal feeling, is that we, are, we tend to kind of uh, run before we can walk on some of these aspects. And it's a very, very big task uh, to be taking on. Finally, there's a need for training. We've heard this uh, many times uh, during the day, training the new generation, but um, as uh, John uh, said, um, I think it's also the existing generation. All of us need to be train to some extent. The technology is moving so fast that we need to keep up uh, with um, uh, with all the, the, the improvement uh, coming up. So training it will be about bridging between academia and industry, and that's really important. Um, and this requires, and it's been discussed several times, the availability of systems to do so. Um, commercial level, semi-commercial level, uh, RAS systems, that can be dedicated to research and development purposes. And uh, there's not many of them. Um, I know there are some in Norway. I know, for example, in Scotland, we don't really have. We, we, we tend to rely on small experimental system. I was also going to say, um, to me, the technology should not be at the expense also of the profitability of the sector. Uh, there's always a risk that because the technology become available, and I mean, there's a lot of great technology, then it would just be applied. Um, and um, th there could be a kind of overkill. It might, it might be more than we need, um, to be honest, to do the job. And then uh, profitability is, uh, is very important. It is a business uh, farming. And as I said, uh, filling up hard disk with data may not be the best way forward. Uh, making sense of the monitoring strategy and understanding the biological needs uh, is, uh, is really uh, critical. So the last session of the day, I'm not going to say much because we, we spent two and a half hours. That was really great. Well done to uh, all the panelists. Um, uh, so I, I will just say a few words about it. And I think we all understand that the interactions in RAS are very complex, involve uh, systems, water, feeds, uh, chemicals, microbiota, and, and fish. <laughs> and all of these interact um, between each other. So to quote uh, John Walden from the session also, I quite like it. He said, many of us have experienced the good, the bad, but mainly the unexplained. Um, and these unexplained are due to the complexity of these interactions, which are very difficult to simulate uh, experimentally. 
So the, the session will focus on suspended particles, salinity, and CO2. Um, these are among the many factors, and there's been a lot of different factors uh, discussed. And the optimal condition uh, for one variable will depend on the others. Um, and I think that's what uh, Rod um, uh, said also, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite very important actually to try to make sense of it. Uh, it's important for both the temporal stability of the system, but also the cutoff um, threshold, if you want, the sweet spot, um, which will be also species uh, specific. So as it was mentioned before, the um, commercial-like system must be available for research. And I think that's really important. And I'm, I know that we are all uh, convinced about this and we need, we need to push. Uh, some discussion were about keeping post mode in uh, seawater recirculation uh, and many other aspects of the rust environment, which I'm not even going to try to wrap up. <laughs> I think there was a lot and very interesting. We only said that uh, the rust technology um, is important, but so is the biology of the species that we want to farm. And I think sometimes uh, we need to refocus a bit on, again, the biology. So overall, uh, to finish up, a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, I think great opportunities for cross-European collaboration here between industry, academia, but also providers, and uh, to help and support the development of farming in recirculation systems. Again, thank you um, for to all the moderators. Um, so Yap, Oiving, and Damien, you've done a, a great job with timekeeping and stimulating discussion. Thanks to presenters, Chris, Bard, uh, and Elena, who gave the latest knowledge in the topics. We also set up the scene uh, in each uh, session. Um, and uh, the panelists for the expert contribution. And I need to finish up very, very quickly. Uh, the audience also for the many question and engagement. And last but not least, the EIS staff. Don't forget that uh, Alistair and Anna in the background has been looking after us all, all day. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to them. Um, this session originally was developed with the help of Elena and Astrid Buran um, with me and the EIS uh, to organize the event. So thank you very much to them. And uh, I officially close now the event. Um, the next RAS at EIS will be in Rimini 2022. Uh, by then, we should all be able to uh, socialize and meet face to face. We were all looking forward. Uh, the topics will be selected and then communicated. And to those that join the EIS event, see you tomorrow morning. Start at 9 a.m. And there's also a rust session on Wednesday morning. So thank you very much to all. It was very enjoyable.